Greetings to all and welcome to uh, IBES. My name is uh, Anne Larry Godry and I'm the Executive Secretary of uh, IBES. And today we are continuing our exciting conversation on transformative change. And this is day three of our three day online conference where uh, we have been starting to explore uh, what a future IBES report on transformative change could uh, address uh, in terms of uh, questions. And so uh, we started this uh, three-day conversation uh, with an overall presentation of IBES. Uh, I presented uh, some of the achievements of the first work program. You know that IBES has been active already for five years and just uh, uh, finished its first work program with a global assessment. So I presented on that a little bit. And then uh, I also explain that IBES now has a new uh, work program going towards 2030 and that three topics have just been approved by the plenary which uh, met uh, in Paris in May. Uh, the first topic is looking at the synergies uh, and the uh, links between sustainable development goals related to water, food, health, uh, climate change and biodiversity with a view to simultaneously achieve all of these goals thanks to biodiversity in particular and that's the IBES angle so that's topic one. Topic two is our topic for today and this is transformative change and topic three is business and biodiversity and this presentation is uh, online and you can consult it uh, as you wish. Uh, then we had on day one a presentation uh, from Kai Chan who is professor at the University of British Columbia and we started to think about transformative change as a system change and so he presented in particular some of the uh, early use of this term in the context of the global assessment uh, of uh, IBES uh, in particular uh, and following uh, his uh, presentation, we then had uh, uh, about an hour and a half of uh, questions with all of you uh, participants and we then opened to a written uh, forum and I will come back to that to explain how that uh, written forum works. So that was uh, for day one. Now yesterday we focused uh, on, on the what uh, to change and we had uh, Dr. Laura Pereira from uh, Stellenbosch uh, University as well as from the Stockholm uh, Resilience Center and there we really uh, thought about what uh, are the leverage points uh, to change uh, the places that we can intervene in the system so we talked about embracing diverse uh, visions of a good life about reducing consumption, uh, about equalities, inequalities, uh, and, and, and many uh, other aspects uh, which uh, we uh, refer to as these leverage points where uh, we think that a small change could really uh, generate uh, bigger changes uh, in other uh, factors. So, and the idea of course with all of this exercise is not to address all of your questions, but to think about what some of the key questions uh, would be that the future IBES assessment uh, would uh, address. So today, uh, day three and last day of uh, this conversation, we focus on the how, how to, how to change. And um, we uh, intend to proceed uh, the same way. And so to have, um, conversation um, where we would first have a presentation then uh, it would be followed by uh, about an hour and a half of exchange uh, with you and then you would be invited to do a written uh, contribution. Um, what we want to think about is how we can uh, change uh, the system, what types of uh, interventions uh, should be targeted what type of uh, actors uh, should be uh, involved and to get us going uh, with this uh, presentation we have uh, a speaker to introduce uh, day three and this is 
uh, Professor Karen O'Brien, and Karen is a professor uh, at the Department of Sociology and Human Geography at the University of Oslo in uh, Norway. Uh, Karen is uh, internationally recognized for her work. Uh, she has uh, focused on climate change and society, particularly uh, on themes related to climate change impacts, uh, vulnerability and adaptation, including how climate change interacts with globalization processes and the implications for human security. And Karen is very uh, committed to transdisciplinarity as well as to integral approaches uh, in her work. And she's been involved in uh, IPCC, but not yet <laughs> in IBES, but hopefully uh, this is about to change. And before I give the floor to, uh, to uh, Karen, I'd like to show uh, one quick slide here. Uh, and this is uh, just a slide on process so that uh, everyone here understands uh, where they fit uh, and how they are contributing into this uh, long-term process. So our journey uh, started uh, this week with this, uh, what we call this pre-scoping uh, event. And uh, our uh, objective with this uh, three-day conference is to really uh, uh, brainstorm about the topic, to start collecting input from all of you, a large diversity of stakeholders, mo mostly focusing on proposing questions uh, that the future assessment would address, as I mentioned uh, earlier. And uh, the next phase then would be a scoping meeting of uh, experts uh, in April 2020. There is currently a call which is about to close uh, for nominations uh, of experts. So people are still uh, invited for a few days to, to apply if they would be interested. And so people would come and sit down uh, for uh, four days and they would uh, be using the input from today's uh, discussion and then uh, frame uh, this assessment and produce a scoping report, which would be an outline of the future assessment report. It would uh, give uh, the number of chapters. It would explain briefly what each one of these chapters would include. It would also include the timeline, uh, as well as uh, elements regarding the methods, the number of authors, the budget, etc. And then based on uh, this scoping report, IBIS 8 in February 2021, would then uh, look at it, uh, discuss it with a view to approve it, and then to uh, allocate the budget and launch the assessment itself, which would then be initiated immediately after uh, IBIS 8. And it is uh, currently envisaged that it would be a three year. Uh, process for which there would be another call for nomination of experts, this time a much larger group to actually produce the uh, assessment on transformative change itself. So this is for the uh, process and now it is uh, my pleasure to give the floor to Karen. Thank you, Anne. Um, yeah, and thanks everybody for being here today for the day three of the online um, webinar. Um, I would like to just, um, I'm going to just share my slides um, quickly. And um, I've been part of, I've been listening to days one and two, and I think that, um, that there were, Kai and Laura just presented such rich information and there were such great discussions. And for today, the question of how do we transform systems is really like the one that is really burning because we know that we need to transform, we know what's at stake, but the question of how do we do it um, is huge. And um, I wish I could answer it in 15 minutes, but I'm just gonna try to provoke some thoughts on that so that we can have a really good discussion about how we might wanna frame our thinking about systems transformation, including what role we as humans play in those transformations. And a lot of this, um, my current research is really looking at um, 
climate change adaptation as transformation, not adapting to the impacts of climate change, but adapting to the very idea that we can transform systems and do this deliberately. So um, the Adaptation Connects project really is about, it stands for combining old and new knowledge to enable conscious transformations to sustainability. And I think that's very much aligned with the IPBES um, framing and um, the ideas. And so in the next minutes, I really wanna, you know, draw attention to this question of how do we deliberately transform systems at the rate, scale, speed, and depth that is called for by the IPBES global assessment and other assessments. Um, because, you know, one thing that came up in some of the questions is this sense of urgency that um, we have to take action now rather than in 10, 15, 20 years. And this raises another question of how do we move from conceptual understandings of transformation into action? You know, how do we take our knowledge and actually apply it so that we start to transform the system? Um, and um, this raises some important questions because transformation is not always um, a neutral process as, as has been raised. And um, in one really, um, Insightful paper, Jess, Jessica Blythe and her colleagues looked at um, the dark sides of transformation about latent risks in contemporary, contemporary sustainability um, discourses. Um, and so I wanna touch on those a little. And then finally, do we actually have to transform our thinking about change in order to address, um, in order to transform systems? And could new metaphors be helpful? And here I'll start to look a little bit at our, our own ways of talking about change through leverage points and levers and whether that's um, helpful. Um, let me just start with, um, I think the conceptual framework um, that developed by IPBES is really um, forward looking and it really is about how I see relationship, how I see systems. It's a conceptual framework that depicts key social and ecological comp components and the relationships between those components. Um, and it acknowledges that conceptual frameworks have an ability to provide a shared language and a common set of relationships and definitions to make complex relationships as simple as they need to be for their intended purposes. And most important, it highlights the importance of including diverse perspectives into the conceptual framework, including different categories and concepts of nature. So one thing that I see coming out again um, in this framework is the focus on relationships. And when I think about systems as relationships, I think we, you know, the, it opens up lots of opportunities to transform. A definition of transformation that I think, you know, very simply is physical and or qualitative changes in form, structure, or meaning making. And this means that it's not just always a, um, an objective measurable thing. Sometimes it's very subtle. Sometimes it's just a little shift in the way that we frame the problem and the solutions. And it's depicted really nicely in this um, picture of, you know, the metamorphosis from the caterpillar to the butterfly, which goes through changes in form, changes in structure, and then you can imagine changes in meaning making because the butterfly would be seeing a very different world than the cater caterpillar. So I think that's really important, but if we actually take transformation, you know, a little bit deeper, we could, it also, um, refers to the powerful unleashing of human potential to care for, affect, um, and, um, and lead change for a better life. So there's something really, you know, like transformation is, is something that can go very deep within um, our individual and collective desires to actually um, survive and thrive. This brings us to the question of systems. You know, what are systems? Um, if you just look it up in the dictionary, a system can be defined as a regularly interacting or interdependent group of items forming a unified whole. And um, in this case, the, um, the, you know, like a system is, we could talk about the earth as a system, but we can also talk about livelihood systems. We could talk about household systems. We can talk about our nervous system, all different things that, and so it's really about where are we drawing those boundaries around the system that we're looking at. Um, Another definition of systems is an organized set of doctrines, ideas, or principles usually intended 
to explain the arrangement or working of a systematic whole. And this is equally important as the first definition because it really is like, you know, how are we actually framing the, um, you know, the problem? What are the our models of causality and the ways that we think about it? And in the Merriam-Webster online dictionary, it actually gives the example of the Newtonian system of mechanics as being part of, um, you know, that second definition. And that brings us then to this idea of leverage points. You know, how do we transform multiple systems, many systems, and how do we do this in, in an equitable and ethical way? And, um, you know, it's not just about um, climate change and biodiversity loss and land use change and fresh water use. It's also about resilience, voice, jobs, energy, social equity, gender, health, water, food. So we're really trying to transform a lot. And this came up a lot in the, some of the discussions from the last two days. It's like, where, what is the entry point for shifting systems at scale? Um, the um, IPBEST framework that was presented by Kai um, and discussed really brings together um, different approaches, not just to the leverage points, but to the levers. And I think this is a really valuable thing to make that distinction is that there's different, you know, it, there's multiple levers, there's going to be multiple ways of engaging with systems change. And they list a number of leverage points. Um, and the one that I want to draw attention to here, which I think is really consistent with um, the, the these broader and deeper approach to transformations is unleashing values and action. And this is something then that, um, you know, where there might be a lot of potential, but it hasn't actually been, um, you know, given that much attention. We talk about values, but how do we actually actualize them? How do we live them to make those changes? And values are inherent throughout the entire report. When we talk about reducing inequalities or promoting equality, um, practicing justice and inclusion. These are all values that apply to the whole or universal values. And this is really an important contribution of, um, of this framework and the report. And I think when we start to look at how are we going to make, how do we transform systems, we're often looking at the leverage points, but often forgetting that about um, the people, the, um, the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight you know, the, the, the many different people that are actually the ones that are transforming the systems, the ones that are creating the leverage, the ones that are, um, are pushing it. And I think um, in my own work, we're really trying to look at people as a transformative force, not people to be change, but actually activating that sense of individual and collective agency for changes that act benefit all. And, um, and this means that, you know, not, obviously many people are already changing um, the world in, in ways that are not positive in terms of um, um, other species, ecosystems, future generations, other people, um, et cetera. But, but I think that like, to get this idea, if, if we actually truly believe that what we do today matters for people in other parts of the world, other species, future generations, how would we, you know, what would that actually mean if we could activate people as um, systems changers and cultural shifters? Um, my work has been very much inspired by um, Dr. Monica Sharma, who's been really looking at how to scale out change. And she makes a point in her book that says, you know, if we want something we've never had, we must do something we've never done before to produce results. And that means kind of getting outside of our own comfort zones and actually starting to look at ourselves as, you know, you know, how, how are we in our own, getting in our own way and how can we be the systems shifters and culture shifters. And a lot of this work is very much based on the idea that every person really does matter and that, um, but they, those, that mattering is really tied to universal values like dignity, dignity, fairness, and compassion, which are inherent in all of us and often stifled through socialization, rigid systems, and cultural norms. So there's a lot of assumptions here that yes, you know, people can actually change. And working with her, um, we've kind of developed these three spheres of transformation, which really is a, it's a heuristic that is, um, you know, I see it very similar to, um, what um, Laura Pereira was talking about is the iceberg model yesterday. And I'll just walk you through this um, quickly, but it's, it's really about practical, political, and personal spheres of transformation, which 
really are about changes in form, changes in structure, and changes in mean, meaning making, but all of them happening simultaneously at the same time, that, that, that we can't ignore one or the other. Um, so in this practical sphere, this is where most of our attention goes. And this, you know, when we talk about Danella Meadows, she talks about, you know, like that these, the, the numbers and the parameters and the, the things that we can measure and move, which include the 169 um, SDG targets. Um, these are the things that we're, we're really trying to change in society. For example, the number of species that are taken off the endangered species list would be one you know, um, check. And, you know, we might read that the um, um, recently that the Kirtland's warbler was taken off the list after a 50-year conservation as a, um, effort. So, so, you know, very positive things or efforts to protect land and oceans like the Half Earth Project or efforts to promote permaculture or biodynamic agriculture, agroecology, less consumption, reduced waste, um, all of these things that we're really striving to achieve. But as we strive to achieve them, we're not Realizing, realizing them at the rate and scale and magnitude that we, we need to. In fact, in some cases, things are getting worse. And we see that likewise with climate change and greenhouse gas emissions. Often we're failing in that practical sphere because we are ignoring or not paying significant attention to the political sphere, the systems and the structures that influence the success or failure of these practical interventions. And by systems and structures here, I mean the social norms and rules and regulations and incentives, all of the things that um, that are made really brought out in the assessment report on um, looking at how governance interventions, you know, um, cross-sectoral cooperation, environmental laws and implementation, how do they make it easy for uh, um, interventions to actually um, create um, the successful outcomes in that practical sphere? The political sphere is important because this is really where we get the conflicts. This is where we get actions that, you know, for example, by the Trump administration to, to weaken the U.S. Endangered Spe Species Act, or um, where we don't have systems in place to recycle alternatives to plastics, so they end up going into the oceans and worsening the ocean pollution problem. So in, in the political sphere, we often get those, um, you know, fights between different people, you know, animal activists and climate activists against um, animal agriculture um, and things. And we get, um, you know, people striving to shift things, but we also get um, pushback from systems and reactions from systems. And we get stuck in the political sphere with very little agreement. And in the climate change um, in the um, area, we've been stuck for decades just to get a, to a voluntary agreement to re reduce emissions in um, Paris 2015. And often when we're getting stuck in this sphere, we're not paying significant attention to the personal sphere. And by the personal sphere, I mean the individual and shared beliefs, values, worldviews, and paradigms that influence exactly the way that we see systems and the way that we relate to systems as individuals and groups and cultures, um, etc. Um, there are some of the key assumptions we hold about causality, about leadership, and, and they really, you know, it's, that's from where our goals are designed. You know, our goals for the sustainable development goals come from a particular worldview and particular values. Um, the goal of continued economic growth comes from another one and that's where we get the conflict value conflicts in that political sphere. So it's really important to recognize those beliefs, values, worldviews, and paradigms um, and think about how do we make those connections in the political sphere with those very diverse views and um, actions and things. And um, I'll just go back here. The um, one thing that I think is a concern is that Oftentimes, when we talk about beliefs, values, worldviews, and paradigms, we're, we're asking people to, um, you know, to change. Yes, we need to change people's beliefs, values, worldviews, and paradigms. And that in and of itself is very difficult and even unethical in some ways. So you're turning people into objects to be changed rather than the subjects of change. So it's almost like we're putting that personal sphere right into the practical sphere and saying, okay, let's just try to, you know, like get people to change. And so to understand how values do change over time and how worldviews do change over time and how people can actually, um, you know, unfold in that development becomes really important. 
And I want to bring attention to the idea of paradigms because um, paradigms are so important and we've talked about them over and over again, shift the paradigm. But a lot of the, um, the way that current systems are organized and structures is really based on the mechanistic, atomistic, deterministic, reductionist, and materialist um, paradigm of the enlightenment, where matter is considered to be just, you know, dead, and, you know, consciousness is the result of brain activity, and free will doesn't necessarily exist. And, and what we see existing in other cultures and emerging here is what we call what Andreas Weber refers to as an enlivenment paradigm that really takes into account lived experience, embodied meaning, subjectivity, consciousness, interbeing, spirituality, and this idea that matter is alive. So these are really important and when we start to, if we go back to the um, Danella Meadows interpretation, um, interpretation of um, leverage points as places to intervene in a system, we see that the lower leverage points really are in that practical sphere. You know, we can work really hard to put half of the world, um, conserve half of the earth, but there is, there's, there's not a lot of leverage there until it comes from the political sphere through the rules of the system, the power to influence the system, the structure of information flows, um, and so on. But where we're at right now is also, you know, given the limited amount of time that we actually do need to work with the goals of the system, the mindset or paradigm from which the system arises, and the power to transcend paradigms. And that becomes really challenging, but I think it's also, it, it's come up again and again in the conversations um, in, the, in these three days of how do we work at that deeper level and what does that involve? And part of this, um, David Bohm, the physicist, um, in his book that really looks at, you know, how do you get to this um, transdisciplinary, interdisciplinary perspective, um, talks about what is primarily needed is a growing realization of the extremely great danger of going on with a fragmentary process of thought. And this fragmentation and fragmented responses and fragmented um, ways of dealing with our ecosystems with our climate really is you know part of the you know the paradigm that's killing us and these partial responses across even they might cover the three spheres but they're not actually engaging with all of them so if we want outcomes for sustainability we actually need to be working with the practical the political and the personal sphere at the same time and while i use this framework very much for you know kind of uh, to understand um transformations. We can also use it as an actionable train, um, framework when we start with the values and start with universal values that apply to everybody and everything. Integrity, oneness, dignity, compassion, equity, inclusion, justice. These are words that appear again and again in um, UN reports and things because you know we recognize this, but how do you actually engage from values to create results and, uh, and I think, you know, to cross that political sphere, what systems need to shift, what cultures need to actually shift, and how does each person then shift that conversation, um, you know, every second of the way. And so rather than maybe that mechanistic lever point um, thing, which I think is really good for understanding, when we get to activating that fra framework, we may have to think in a different paradigm and start thinking, for example, of fractals. Fractals, um, change are actually um, you know patterns that repeat themselves at different scales self-similar patterns and you have them in nature you have them in algebra you have them in geometry and um, interestingly we have them in human beings in the patterns of what we do and when we link them to the values that we have we start to create patterns at all scales so we get, get rid of the bottom up top down or um, small scale large scale but we start to create these self-repeating um, patterns and you know looking at this idea of the fractal is um, you know I don't know that there's a wide literature but I have seen some literature on this on urban fractals a network that contains an essential essential characteristics of a larger network of a city each fractal will, will possess nodes or centers and patterns of connectivity that define its structure and organization and it will exhibit characteristics of community associated with living processes a particular type of cultural fractal this is from Paul Downton's book um, 
ecopolis, um, ecopolis. And here's just saying the urban fractals that contain the patterns and processes of ecocities development of the urban fractal. It's a repetitive pattern over and over. And what this does is when you actually look at change over time, you know, often we look at, oh my gosh, you know, technologies and behaviors can change over, you know, a decade or two decades. Systems and structures often take longer because we have investments in infrastructure, we have, you know, politics and rules and things. And then, oh gosh, beliefs, values, and worldviews, they take, you know, centuries to change. You know, traditions are very firm. If we start to think of you know, our goal of a thriving planet through these different spheres of transformation based on universal values. We see that every moment, every action that we take is actually, you know, right here, right now in, you know, it's covering all of them. So we're shifting systems and structures right now. So the 2030 agenda actually needs to come, it's, it becomes the 2019 agenda. And so we're starting to make those shifts in our own, you know, the right way we relate to beliefs, values, worldviews, paradigms, systems, and structures, and technologies and behaviors. And importantly, you know, for people to say like, oh, we, you know, it's going to take so long. We actually don't need to change 51% of the system for social change because we are connected, because we are social, because language and meaning change. Um, some studies on social tipping points um, based on agent-based modeling show that it's only, you know, 10%, some say 20%, 12%, 5%, uh, 25%. Um, whatever, but the point here is that um, that changes can actually happen much faster than we think when we actually activate them um, more deeply. And this brings me finally to this important role of the language that we're using in our reports, in our everyday um, words and things. And um, George Lakoff and Mark Johnson emphasize that new metaphors have the power to create a new um, reality. This can begin to happen when we start to comprehend our experience in terms of a metaphor, and it becomes a deeper reality when we begin to act in terms of it. Much of cultural, cultural change arises from the introduction of new metaphorical concepts and the loss of old ones. And I, so this is just a call to a little bit of awareness in what metaphors we are actually using. And you know, to pay attention, because I think the leverage points really is powerful, but we can also start to see that, as was pointed out when I was presenting once about it, is like, that is a mechanistic, um, point. So how do we start to take in some of this new ideas about entanglement, for example, that we are non-locally connected, whether through language, through meaning, or just through um, actual physical entanglement of um, molecules and atoms. Um, complementarity, this idea that, um, you know, gets to the both and that you can't observe all properties at the same time and Laura was talking about that capacity to hold paradox and get comfortable with that and um, and this links to the wave particle duality but also individual collective bottom up top down etc and finally you know potentiality becomes really important to see what is that potential in the moment here for change and um, the seeds the idea of seeds the ideas that off, you know, often it's off the radar, but things are popping up everywhere that is, has that potential for transformative change. And I just want to end by, um, as, by saying that, you know, like one thing that we don't actually include in our discussions of transformative change is this idea of like love. And I actually put it on a thing going like, oh my gosh, can we actually talk about love? And I looked in chapter five of the um, global assessment and there was, it used it once called, it was like love of shoes was the um, context where it's like, oh, well, we're getting there. But, um, but in general, I just think that, you know, people's passion, their desire, their connection to nature exists. And I think we can tap into that and tap into these deeper human dimensions to actually activate those changes in the political and, um, and practical spheres that, um, that is called for at this time. So with that, I didn't come up with any real questions for, um, you know, to follow up on, but what I think we could do is, you know, I think there'd be plenty of room for discussion, but things that stand out for me is, you know, how do we take, you know, a, you know, how do we pay attention to the ethical and equitable, dim equitable dimensions of transformation um, and the normative dimensions, but also, um, you know, this idea of not imposing transformations, but activating transformations or what Laura referred to as the transformative potential of everyone. So thank you very much. And I'll be happy to take, um, yeah, start the discussion. Well, thank you very much.